how can you be a little strategic mm. so you stack the odds in your favor that the people you do get to meet at that event yeah. could be those who could help you and I think that kind of nicely takes us into the personal brand mm. space in terms of <laughs> how do you stand out and the things that you do and, and just the small things. So mm. the attention to detail and the sitting in the front row and making connections and building your network and not going, I'm going to write a book tomorrow, but it's yeah. like, this is part of my journey and I'm going to be doing it. And, you know, that took, what, 2019. So we're talking two, two mm. three years till and, it actually happened. And standing out is so important because we're in a very noisy world right now. Mm. If you look at any industry, there is so much competition. Yeah. And if you're not looking to stand out, you're only going to become a me too. Mm. Because fundamentally, all of our products and services are the same. Yeah. Welcome to the Kelly Limber podcast, Simon. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And welcome to Dubai. I love this place. I'd like to say you flew in for this podcast. <laughs> that was not the case. So what were you actually doing here? What was your, your, your motive for coming? Sure. So the motive for being here was I was invited to speak at an event. Mm -hmm. It happened just yesterday. Yep. And I touched on how constraints breed creativity, how organizations and individuals can tap into their creative energy, which so many of us forget. Yeah. And I decided to come here for a week to not just speak at that event, but also to catch up with friends uh, and to have conversations with people like yourself. Amazing. So for those that maybe don't know, haven't come across your book that you released last year, can you tell everyone who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. So when I grew up in the United Kingdom, I had this mistaken belief that my success would be defined by my job title. Yeah. Be a banker, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an accountant. And so when I graduated from university, I fell into the world of finance yeah. at what was probably the worst possible time. It was the middle of 2007, mm -hmm. a year before the global financial crisis swept across the planet. Yeah. And just to make things a little more interesting, the company that I started with was Lehman Brothers. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you know <laughs> which, which fell there. into administration yes. yeah, 14 yeah. months after I joined. Now, even though I stuck in finance for nearly 10 years after that because all i knew at the time was finance yeah. given my background and the people i spent time with it started a thought process that led me to what i now get to do today so i began to ask myself questions such as what did success mean to me mm -hmm. and what sort of impact did i want to have in the world now i didn't have a full picture at the time but i just started brainstorming ideas of things i was curious about and that led me into the world of coaching Mm. And at the end of my corporate career, yeah. I said to myself, if I could build a business where I could successfully coach one to one people who were amazing and inspiring, I would be a happy man. But the thing is, when you start to pursue something you're passionate about, lots of other paths begin to open. Yeah. And so a year year to two years into it, yeah. uh, not only was I coaching people one to one, but I was then invited to speak at events. Uh, invited to conferences, invited to organizations. And I said to myself, actually, I think speaking is my thing. Mm. And so my business started pivoting more towards the speaking side. Yeah. And that really was what opened the doors to all of the opportunities. Uh, so I got invited to BBC News, Sky News to talk about my work. And then in 2020, just as the world was entering its first lockdown, mm. I got a meeting with Penguin, uh, and we discussed writing my first book, Energize, which which was released just uh, just two years ago now. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I am <laughs> midway reading Energize, and I love it. Um, so maybe let's kind of go there, and then I want mm. to go back into the, the speaking parts, because I know that there's yeah. people listening on, they want to transition into maybe mm -hmm. coaching, and then they're thinking, but how do we do the steps? So let's come back to that. Let's talk about the book. So how yeah. did that kind of come about, and the whole energy perspective, which I love? There's a book called The Third Door by mm -hmm. Alex Benayan, and mm -hmm. that book really sparks my interest into thinking smarter, not mm -hmm. working harder, but thinking smarter. Mm -hmm. So the essence of The Third Door is that when you go to a club, there are always two entrances. Yeah. So the first entrance is the main one. So you queue up with yeah. your group of friends, uh, you wait your turn to get to the front, hopefully the bouncer lets you in, and then you're into the club. Yeah. That's the first door. The second door is the red carpet entrance. It's for the 1%. Mm -hmm. It's the celebrities, the influencers, the millionaires. They go through that door into the club. But there is always a third door. And that third door is something you have to create. So it could be the fact that you know one of the cleaning team who has a key through the side entrance. It could be the fact that you have a mutual friend with the manager of the club. But there is always a third door. And so in August 2019, 
I was approached by a boutique publisher yeah. and they said, Simon, have you written a book before? We would love to explore being your partner to help yeah. get your book out into the world. And when they gave me the contract, for me, when I looked at it, it was a win-lose. It felt like a win for them mm -hmm. and a lose for me. Yeah. And so I said, maybe even though this isn't the right opportunity now, maybe this is the universe telling me I'm meant to write a book. And it was never, never the top of my list. Yeah. But suddenly I listened to the universe. I said, maybe there's a sign. It's a sign I'm meant to begin thinking about this, uh, this journey. Yeah. And so later in the year, I decided to get intentional about it. I sat down and I said to myself, if I only write one book, because I don't know if I'm going to write a second, a third or fourth, but if I only write one book, yeah. who would I love to publish it with? And I wrote down the names of the top publishers, Penguin, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, Hay House, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And then I got strategic. I went to their websites and I looked at all of the upcoming book releases uh, that they were putting out there. Mm -hmm. And I signed myself up to as many book launch events as I could. Nice. Not only that, but when I got to these launch events, I would arrive early and make sure I would sit as close as possible, if not at the front row. Yeah. Because when you sit at the front row, you begin to meet very interesting people. It could be the team behind the speaker. Mm -hmm. It could be the editors or those connected to the publishers. Mm -hmm. And so I just started developing my network into the publishing industry just to learn the mechanics of how to get a book out there. Yes. And then as it got to Christmas, I thought this is the time of the year where people feel happier and more joyful. So they might be a little more responsive than usual. And so I started sending uh, messages to all of the contacts I'd built uh, through this journey. Now, I connected with them first so that they could see my content mm -hmm. on, on social media. So by the time I sent that email, yeah. it's not like they didn't know who I was. It was more of a warm connection. Mm -hmm. And only one responded. And she said to me, would you like to come to our offices in January in the new year? And that was from Penguin. No so way. that's how the journey really began. <laughs> yeah. uh, because I noticed that in order to get a book deal, especially with a traditional well-established publisher, yeah. you only get it through two routes. The first route is via an agent. Mm -hmm. And the second is that the publisher knows you and likes what you do. Yeah. Now, the second is harder. Yeah. But I wanted to try that route because I knew that if I went through the agent route, that could take years. Yeah, absolutely. Because Haven't been agent, down that route yet. Yeah, because the agent has to like you. The agent has to love your work and then they have to go and pitch it. Yeah. So there's an additional step before you get to the uh, to the potential of being published. I love that from the setting <laughs> intentions. And I think that whole piece is then taking the action on that. Absolutely. You, you have to be a bit bold, but also different. Mm. You don't just want to show up, but how can you show up in a way that gets noticed? Because everybody has short attention spans. There's no way you're going to get to know everyone mm. at, at an event. So how can you be a little strategic? Mm. So you stack the odds in your favor that the people you do get to meet at that event yeah. could be those who could help you. And I think that kind of nicely takes us into the personal brand mm. space in terms of <laughs> how do you stand out and the things that you do and, and just the, t the small things. So mm. um, the attention to detail and the sitting in the front row and making connections and building your network and not going, I'm going to write a book tomorrow, but it's yeah. like, this is part of my journey and I'm going to be doing it. And, you know, that took, what, 2019. So we're talking two, two mm. three years till and, it actually happened. And standing out is so important because we're in a, we're in a very noisy world right now. Mm. If you look at any industry, there is so much competition. Yeah. And if you're not looking to stand out, you're only going to become a me too. Mm. Because fundamentally, all of our products and services are the same. Yeah, you, agreed. You look in any yeah. industry, if you look at the, the baseline level, yeah. what they actually do, company to company, is, is very similar. But what differentiates them is the story and the brand they create. It's why you can go to any sports shop, you can buy a pair of trainers. Or you can buy a pair of trainers from Nike and it just feels different mm. because of the connection you have with that brand. Mm. So if you have the ability to stand out and create a connection with your audience, they're not only going to become your best marketers because they're going to talk about how amazing it is to do business with you, yeah. but they're going to be happy to just represent everything that you're about. So what would be some of your tips then in that journey of standing out or, mm. the, or what would you say some of the things is that you can stand out with for your personal brand? Sure. I would say when you're starting out and this, this is much better to apply when you're, when you're at the beginning, because as you get bigger, it's harder to do these things. Mm. But when you first start out, you want to look at what activities can you do that are not scalable? Okay. So what activities can you do that are not scalable? So do what is not scalable. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So if someone sends me a request on LinkedIn or I send them a request on LinkedIn, 
if I accept or they accept, within the first two or three days, I would drop them a voice note, seven to eight seconds voice note, mm. just to say, hey, I'm Simon, great to connect with you, look forward to learning more about your work. Now, this works on two fronts. The first is you get a near 100% conversion rate. If I send you a text message and you get a notification on your phone and you have a preview of what's in it, you might go, oh, it's about that. I'll come back to it later. And then you'll forget about it. Mm. But if I send you a voice note yeah. and all you see is the play icon, but you don't know what's in it, we're curious beings. We want to know what's in that voice note. And so you <laughs> click it and you listen to it. Yeah. The second reason why it's powerful is because voice carries energy. Mm. If you read an email or text message, you don't know the emotional state someone was in when they wrote it. So you could interpret it in yeah. a multitude of ways. Yeah, yeah. But when you hear somebody's voice, you feel emotion. And emotion is nothing more than energy and motion. And so you get a feel for what that person is about. Yeah. Especially if you want to become a speaker. No, you know, you're using great. your voice. <laughs> you're using your voice. So that's one example mm. of how you can do something that is not scalable. Because when you grow your audience, of course, you can't do that. You, you can't do that. But when you're at the beginning you want to look at those things that are not scalable because that is going to stand you out very quickly. And another one is gratitude. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I was invited to do the Sky News interview, on the way out, I said to, 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 to the guard at the front, can you, if it's okay, can you share with me the names of the people that got me into, into this interview? So he shared with me three names uh, of people that were responsible for getting me in for this opportunity. So within a week, what I did is I went to a website, I ordered some chocolate for each of them, just to say thank you so much uh, for inviting me for that opportunity. Yeah. And they dropped me a WhatsApp and they said, Simon, thank you so much. You made us the heroes of our team. Everybody loved the gifts that you sent. Aww. And I responded and I said, I'm surprised. Doesn't every guest send something to you mm. as, a, as, a, as a gesture of thanks? And they said, you'll be surprised. We, we don't receive that much. Yeah. So just doing that small act of kindness and gratitude stood me out. I love that. So the last pillar in my book on the the, the brand new formula mm. is stand out. <laughs> and how do you stand out? And the title of the book is called De Seed the Lemon. Mm -hmm. So De Seed the Lemon is exactly what you're describing. It's the small acts that make the biggest difference, like yeah. deseeding a lemon. Mm. You take the pip out. It's a bit of effort, <laughs> but the drink's just nicer because you don't have pips floating around. Absolutely. And the visual analogy of that going into exactly what you did. What are the names? Names and how can I just send something to them to say thanks and appreciation? I it, love it. it. it, it it's, it's how you are and how you connect with someone. Yeah. One of the things I love doing when it comes to speaking is very often I will stay until the very last person gets their question answered, gets a photo or gets to ask me something they want to share. Yeah. Because they've come and I want to show gratitude to them. Yeah. You've made the effort to come to this event. You've made the effort to come and support me. Mm. I want to make sure that after the event, I'll be next to the stage. I want to answer as many questions as I can. Mm. And that has often resulted in me staying after for around two to three hours. But for me, it's a small act in, in the grand scheme of it because that's what makes you stand out. You are giving back to the audience. Mm. You are showing that you care. And, and that is all about your branding. It's about who you are. So let's talk a little bit on that speaking mm. front, because I know that those that are listening, like that's <laughs> the dream. Like we've had some fabulous guests on that work with some incredible companies, you know, yourself included. Mm. And I think those listening would love to know, how do you get those gigs or how do you kind of what tips would you have for someone who's wanting to establish a speaking career? Well, I'll start with one thing not to do. And then we'll dive into what to do. So one thing I see a lot of people do, which is definitely a no-no, is you go into social media and then you go, everyone, I speak about this, this and this. If you need to book a speaker for your next event, get in touch, call me, hire me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. Okay. What you want to do is you want to get them excited that they have to have you at their event. Mm. Now, when you first begin, of course, you're not going to have a huge brand uh, around yeah. the speaking because you don't have the experience, you don't have the exposure. You have to think strategically. So what I did when I first started, um, and it, it was a website that was popular back then, but I'm not sure it is as popular now, yeah. but there was this meetup.com uh, website. Yeah. And I would look at all the local events going on and I would simply message the organizer, hey, when you're next doing an event, I can speak about this, but I would do it for free. Mm -hmm. In exchange for getting some content and getting a testimonial. 
So I was approaching it with a win-win. Yeah. So if I'm rubbish, then you haven't spent a single cent. Yeah. So you haven't lost anything financially. But if I'm good, your audience are going to love it. And you're going to get a lot of credibility on the back of it. How did you find the you speaker? You get practice. And I get practice. Yeah. And for me, that was a far better route than going down to some speaking clubs and learning how to speak. Because for me, nothing, nothing beats putting yourself in a live environment where yeah. you know nobody in the room. Mm. Because that builds your confidence. If mm. you can do it once, you can do it again and again and again. Mm. And so that's what I did at the beginning. But when I when I think about speaking, there's two parts of it. Yeah. One is the practice of speaking. Can you deliver a good presentation? Mm -hmm. So that's something you want to master. It's a skill. How do you get better? How do you learn from people ahead of you? That's the delivery side. But unless you also enjoy the business development side, all you have is a hobby. You have a hobby of speaking on stages, but there's no business behind it. Yeah. So in order to start getting paid and getting the opportunities, you have to look at your speaking as a business, mm -hmm. as, as its own revenue stream. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is when you speak, it's not just about the speaking. A lot of people think, okay, I'm going to do this speaking event. I've got to practice. I've got to remember. I get to the stage. Am I going to remember all the stories I want to share and the message? Whew, it's done. It's finished. I'm off. Next one. Now, if you approach it that way, it's going to be a lot harder in the long term because mm. you're not approaching each opportunity in a strategic way. Here's what you should actually do if you want to do it in a strategic way. Yeah. The actual event is just one part of the journey. You then have the pre-speaking, what I call hype, mm -hmm. and the post-speaking distribution. Mm -hmm. So with the pre-speaking hype, how are you hyping your audiences up that you're going to be speaking that event? So if you are going to a big conference where there are thousands of people attending and there are other speakers who are also going to be speaking at the same time, by you hyping up your talk, you're going to drive the audience to come to your talk at that conference. And that's where people start to get interested. Mm. Whose talk are you going to? Oh, I'm going to Simon's talk. Oh, who's Simon? Let's check him out. So you're starting to get that audience ready yeah. for your talk ahead of you actually going onto stage. Yeah. And then at the event... You want to have someone, it could just be a friend when you start, capture content. Yeah. Ideally photos and videos, but at a minimum photos, yeah. high quality photos. And then post the event, mm -hmm. this is where the post distribution comes in. You want to have a variety of things that you can then share. So it could be video capturing a conversation you've had with a member of the audience. Yeah. It could be a highlight reel. Um, it could be still photos uh, from you on stage. It could be a post describing what you shared in, uh, in, in, with, with the crowd there. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that sells you better than you going out and saying, hey, I speak, do you want to book me? Because when people look at that, they see the energy that you brought to the room. If yeah. it's a video, they see how you interacted with the audience. Mm. They see what you're like as a speaker. And when I look back at the content I've shared post speaking at every event, the one that does the best is the videos that capture me talking to audience members after. Mm. There was one that I shared, uh, it was the end of 2022. And that one must have got me nearly 30 inquiries on the back of it. DM saying, what did you talk about? Um, how do we book you for an event? What are your rates? From you just communicating. From me just sharing this video. Which was the video of you communicating with people at the end. Yeah, just having a conversation with someone. Wow. And I put it onto LinkedIn, uh, as well as other platforms. Yeah. And I had nearly 30 inquiries. And it was just this video of somebody coming up to me as I was signing books, saying, we were exhausted. You came on stage. We were so energized. I just feel like I'm seeing life through a different lens now. Can I take a photo? Can you sign a book? It was a raw in the moment testimonial. It wasn't scripted. Uh, it wasn't produced. It was really raw. Yeah. And that emotion came out. And so when people saw it, you got curious. You're like, I want to bring that feeling into my audience. And so that's how I would approach it is mm -hmm. master the skill on one side of speaking, but then start to fall in love with the business development side. How can you be a little smart and strategic with the speaking yeah. so that more people go, hey, why don't we know about you? Yeah, and we need to. That's excellent <laughs> advice. Have you found having a book has increased the speaking opportunities? Mm. Absolutely. There was a quote by a friend of mine called Daniel Priestley. Yeah. And he said, the book that changes your life is not the book that you read, but the book you write. Oh, I love that. And that is so true <laughs> because... Not only getting a book that were Penguin, but then also having the likes of Simon Sinek and Ali Abdal and Marshall Goldsmith and Marie Folio endorsing it. Yeah. 
really helped not only to get the book out into the world, yeah. but to open up opportunities for me. So since the book was released, I've had the chance to speak at a number of festivals uh, across the world, mm -hmm. uh, come to places like here in Dubai, uh, in the US. I'm going to Singapore and Ireland in the next couple of months yeah. just to talk about what I do yeah. and to share the messages that are, that are within the book I wrote. It's the process of writing the book where you say that it's, it's about, from what I'm picking up from everything mm. that you're saying, there's a strategy in everything. And I think people yeah, don't and, understand and, and that. It's the, same, it's the same thing with speaking. Yeah. And when I look at friends who have put proposals to publishers and why they failed, I think it's failed because of one reason, which is very similar to what I shared about speaking, yeah. is when you are putting your idea out there, mm -hmm. we focus too much, I think, on the book itself. Yeah. What are the contents? What is the message? Why me? Why now? Uh, we want to get that perfect. But we often neglect the business plan. Mm. How are you looking to market it? What is the roadmap for the six months leading to launch? The two months after launch? The six months after launch? How are you going to keep getting the book out there in the years after it's published? Mm -hmm. Who are you going to get endorsements from? Yeah. Who do you think will help support you? What communities do you, do you tap into? to get the book out to a bigger audience. Yeah. We don't tend to focus much on that side. It may be a few pages, but there's no real meat there. Mm. So if you have a lot more meat there and you bring that together with a solid book idea, that increases your chances. And that's why for me, when when, when the book came out, I love the marketing side. Yeah. You, you know, I've often, I've often been asked, what are some of the skills that make a successful entrepreneur? And for me, one of them is to think like a marketer. Because you might have a really good product or service, but if you don't know how to market it, yeah. No one Nobody's going to know are. about it. Yeah. And so I really led from the front when it came to the marketing of the book. So to give you a few things that we did, uh, we partnered with the Connaught Hotel in London's Mayfair, yep. one of the most iconic hotels in the world. And we worked with Jamie Oliver's production team to shoot the bar, creating an energized cocktail. Nice. So if you went to that bar and you ordered the cocktail, it would be mixed in front of you and then served on a copy of my book. Yeah. And so people would take selfies, um, photos, videos. They became my marketers. Yeah. The audience became my marketing team. And then a few months after publication, we put together one of the world's first book launches in the metaverse. Mm. So people could put on their VR headsets and it was my avatar talking to you in the virtual world, flicking through pages of my book in, in, in virtual reality. Yeah. And again, people couldn't help but talk about it. Yeah. And so when you think different, experiment with stuff and collaborate with people, not necessarily within your industry, but outside of your industry, you get seen as an innovator. Mm. What do you think the biggest takeaway is from your book for someone who maybe hasn't picked it up? Why should they pick it up or what do you think they'll get from it? Biggest takeaway in one sentence from the book is this. Energy management, not time management, is the key to productivity. Mm. Because if you focus exclusively on time management, it assumes that your energy is constant throughout the day, which yeah. it isn't. Yeah. So it's really a synergy between energy and time. If you can work better with your body, not against it, then what happens is you actually maximize the time you have. I mean, just think about a moment in your day. If you go into that one hour exhausted and tired, you're not going to get the same amount of output yeah. as if you went into that same hour with high energy. So true. With focus. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's why people can wake up early in the morning if they have to make a flight to a two week exotic holiday, but they can't do it every day. They're able to do that because they're energized. They're excited yeah, about the so, holiday. It's so true, actually. And so <laughs> it's okay. I got to get up at 4 a.m. to make the flight. I'm up. I've packed my bags. Everything's done, super focused. Yeah. We are productive to the max. Yeah. But on a normal day, if there's no energy there, yeah. if we're not energized by something, we lie in. We hit the snooze button. Yeah. And we just want to relax in bed. I always think of Christmas morning. <laughs> and being, oh, you wake up so early because of the what's ahead. But it's yeah, true. It's, That's it's, it's another aspect it? it's, it's of the energy. The... And, and so this is why so many people are sleepwalking through life. They're sleepwalking mm. through life because they think they're going places, but they're not. There's a difference between movement and progress. You can be busy moving in circles, but not really progressing. Mm -hmm. Or you could be progressing slowly, but then that's that energy that you get from it. Yeah. And that's why momentum is such a powerful experience. Yeah. When you have that feeling of momentum of, I'm going places, that just gets you out of bed. Yeah. That's the energetic pull of a vision. The energetic pull of uh, seeing your head where you want to be. Mm. Motivation is the opposite. Motivation is more of a push force, which means you need more and more of it. 
And short-lived, I think. Short-lived. Yeah. Because you might say to yourself, oh, I need a bit of motivation to get out of bed today. So you watch a YouTube video yeah. and it pushes you out of bed. Yeah. But then you need it again. And again, you need that hit again and mm. again. But if you can find the source of inspiration within, mm -hmm. connect to that journey, that vision of who you want to be, that's a pull force. That just mm. pulls you out of bed. You don't know how you got out of bed in the morning, but you just sprang out of bed. Yeah. I, I read in your book, like a big part for you was mm. the health and fitness side of it. Absolutely. And the direct uh, mm. reflection and the energy piece for you on that yeah, journey. So, so when you think about energy, the, there are four dimensions. You have physical energy, mental energy, yeah. spiritual energy, yeah. and emotional energy. Yeah. And for me, it always begins with physical energy. That's why I started the first chapter mm -hmm. with invest in your health. Mm. Because if there is anything the pandemic taught us, it is that without your health, you can't do anything. Yeah. All those hopes and dreams and goals you have, I mean, you can't fulfill them. Mm. Because if you don't have health, you, you, you can't achieve it. Yeah. Uh, so if you're healthy, you're going to have lots of hopes and dreams and goals. Yeah. If you're sick, you only have one. Get to get to get better and so if you are able to prioritize your sleep your nutrition and movement you give yourself a powerful foundation mm. to spring forwards and when i look at my journey the moment i prioritize my physical energy suddenly i wanted to improve every area of my life you know when i was working out on a consistent basis that meant i wanted to eat better yeah when i ate better I felt more energized. When I felt more energized, I wanted to take on more challenges. Mm. When I took on more challenges, I wanted to think bolder and change my environment. So it becomes this domino effect in action. Yeah, it's so true because having been on the, the journey <laughs> myself, and I actually posted this morning on social media my morning routine. So mm -hmm. I get up at 4.45, I walk to the gym at 5, yeah. 5.30. But that's a, it's, it's a seven day a week thing because I wake up at the same time mm. on the weekend. Yeah. But it's interesting you describing it as the push in the pool. Mm. For years before, there would need to be some sort of motivation to get me out yeah. of bed. Whereas now it's part of my identity. It's I wake up, I love it, and I yeah. go for it. You tapped on something important there because the reason most of us need a push is because when we make decisions in the present, we're working from our past selves. Yeah, We're referencing our past selves and experience. Mm -hmm. But when you now find it easy just to get up and do it, the reason is what got you started is very likely you working from your future self. So you're looking mm. to the future and you're saying, what is the Kelly I want to be? Yeah. What is that Kelly doing? What is the routine she's embracing? And then you're making present day decisions based on your future self. And mm. that's where the pull comes in. Your future pulls you forward. Yeah. Where sometimes with your past, it stops you from making progress. So when you work from the identity of the future self and you act from that identity now, well, you don't have to have trouble making a decision. You yeah. have no trouble. Yeah. If I operated from the future identity of Simon is an athlete, Simon is someone living a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go to the local supermarket, I don't have to worry about deciding which aisle to push my trolley down. It's made for me. Yeah. I'm going straight to the fresh fruit and veg aisle. Yeah. I'm not going to be pushing down the frozen food and ready meal section. I don't have to worry about that thought. But if I'm working from my past experience, my past self, mm. I might be stuck in indecision. Or maybe I will do this. Maybe, maybe I'll just this week, I'll do it. But if I'm operating from my future self and acting from that place, yeah. that identity is powerful. What was one of the hardest things in the shifts you think you had to make yourself? The hardest shift for me was probably the mental side. Okay. Uh, because when I was in employment, it felt relatively safe. Mm -hmm. You can predict your next month's income. Yep. You knew what your week was going to look like yeah. and also your day ahead. Yeah. But when I moved from being an employee to an entrepreneur, you had zero visibility. Especially at the beginning, you didn't know month to month where, where income would come from. Mm. Uh, there was no guarantee. Yeah. Everything was also now on you. You know, in a company, you can kind of say, oh, he or she would do it, uh, we'll worry about it later. But if you don't drive things forward in your business, nothing gets done. Very true. So it was that shift in my head of expectation management, uh, which I think was the toughest, especially because nobody in my immediate family had run a business, let alone a successful business, yeah. but just run a business. And so it meant I had to think about changing my environment, uh, which was tough because I grew up as an introvert. Uh, you know, I was, I was very stereotypical as a, as a Chinese. I was the academic one that was in the corner reading lots of books and getting all my homework done on time. And so I was never the one that would put my hand up and say, I'll go to the front of the class and talk about what I did on the weekend. Until I realized that when I changed my environment and now the business was about me 
I had no choice. Mm. I had no choice but to get out there, share my voice with the world. And in the process, what I learned is that when you use your voice, you begin to find your voice. Mm. So when you're in that space there of, because I think people listening will be transitioning. Mm. There's a lot of people in that transition space yeah. there. What does changing your environment mean? Because people will be thinking, do I need to change my whole, do I need to move? Do I need to change my whole friendship group? Like what, what did that yeah. look like for you? So for me, the first place it started is books. So you want to start easy. You want to start with things that are yeah. easy first. You don't want a wholesale change because if you look at the wholesale change, it can be overwhelming. And then you don't do anything. And then you don't do anything. <laughs> so you want to start with very small steps. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't doing much reading. You know, most of us, we don't do. When we finish formal education, uh, statistics show the amount of books we read heavily declines. Oh, I thought I'd never have to read again yeah. when I left high school. <laughs> I was like, yes, no more reading. It's like, how naive, you know? Yeah, but because you the thing is, we only read in formal education because we have to yeah. in order to pass a formal exam. But when we come out into the world, we just stop reading. So you know, true. in fact, I think there was a stat by YouGov that said, if you read 50 books a year, that puts you in the top 1% of Americans because 99% of people won't read nearly 50 books a year. They, they, they just won't. That puts you straight away in the top 1% of yeah. people in America. Wow. Now, when I first started, it was books. Okay. It was accessing the insights and the mindsets of mentors. Yeah. And so I started buying books within personal development, within business, marketing yeah. and entrepreneurship, just to start changing uh, the wiring in my brain yep. so I could think as an entrepreneur. Firstly, I did that, and then it was what I watched and what I listened to. These were the easy wins. Mm. And these are simple things we can do now. Yeah. You don't have to wait until a certain point in your, in your journey. You can do this today. Yeah. Once I did that, I then said, okay, I'm going to start to go to events and networking uh, meetups where yeah. I can expose my brain uh, to different people, to people who are doing the things that I want to do. Mm. And that was the next step. And then everything else started to fall into place after that. Because once I changed my network over time, I got invitations to join a mastermind group. Mm -hmm. I got invited to retreats. Uh, somebody said, Simon, I think you should connect with this person. People started introducing me to more people. And when I look back, it makes me see this journey as environment optimization. Uh, that's what really helped me at the beginning mm. is optimizing my environment. Yeah. So when people come to me sometimes and say, what is the fastest way for me to make progress? Well, create an environment from today that makes it impossible not to succeed. Create an environment today that makes it impossible not to succeed. And what that means in practice is all the activities, decisions, and choices you are making today onwards yeah. is stacking the odds in your favor that you will get rewards down the line. Now, you don't control the rewards. You know They may or may not happen or they may or may not come. Yeah. All you can do is stack the odds in your favor. And the more you do that, the greater the surface area of luck Mm, it's like sowing the seeds all Absolutely. underground and then all you can do is win. plant seeds plant seeds plant yeah. seeds but you have no idea which one of those seeds will eventually blossom into an orchard mm, so what's next in your orchard what seeds have you been <laughs> planting that was a really nice intro into yeah. what's next for you so for me i'm always focused on bettering myself so i always ask myself so what's the next level what's the next level mm -hmm. so one of the things i've been looking at this year which uh, i know we touched on before we recorded was was the youtube channel so that's something in my focus at the moment mm -hmm. so i i've been in a mastermind group with the likes of daniel Priestley and ali abdal and they challenged me to look into the into the youtube side of things yeah. and hence that's been one of my challenges this year and also tv and film that's mm -hmm. something i want to explore yeah uh, so i've done the books so i do the speaking i do the coaching that for me is a nice challenge in the medium term yeah. to see if i can translate some of the work i do onto the medium of tv and film I love that. I love that. <laughs> At the end of every podcast, because I feel I, honestly, I could sit here and we could continue talking, <laughs> which is what I love about the power of podcasting, to be mm. honest, is the opportunities that it gives you yeah. to meet new people, to learn about their stories, to walk away inspired <laughs> and then have a new platform of people that know about your book or what it is that you're doing. So thank you so much for your time. I really could uh, stay here longer. I'd like to always wrap up with... Uh, some questions, mm -hmm. kind of quick fire. I, mean, I gave you the heads up so you don't know this is not coming. Um, from Esther Perel's uh, box of um, just, what does she call it? Um, where should we begin? They're really mm -hmm. nice questions. So are you okay if I pick a couple? And Let's then... do it. I, I love this sort of uh, games, actually. Yeah, good. I'm always the one that brings them out at the end of a party. <laughs> and then the party ends up going on way longer than it should do. <laughs> I'm irrational when it comes to. 
I would say I'm irrational when it comes to probably travel. Uh, okay. Very disciplined, very rational with every other day to day choice. Uh, but I like to enjoy my travel. So sometimes I can think a bit irrationally because for me, it's an experience. Yeah. And if I do it with my family, I want to make sure we all have a good time. That's the one thing I will spend a little more on yeah. without feeling guilty. Yeah. Uh, just because I don't, I don't shop a lot. I, 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 I run quite a minimal life. If, if you see my content on social media of me on stage or interacting with people in my day-to-day -day life, I just have a black T-shirt and jeans. Yeah. I'm a very simple person, but travel is probably one thing I'm a little little irrational with. I love that. I remember years ago, actually, it was a podcast, and I think it might have been Ramit that uh -huh. was talking about money dials. Yeah. And the whole concept that we all have money dials mm. and some money dials will be more for others. So your money dials is is not maybe necessarily the material things, it's the experience yeah. and it's the travel, mm. whereas others might be, you know, experiences for the family or this or, or, yeah. or whatever it is. And I always thought that's really interesting because sometimes when you look at how other people spend, you're like, oh, mm. I wouldn't do that. But when yeah. you go, that's what they like, that's their dial. Exactly, but it's also the alignment. Yeah. You know, for me, what I love about travel and experiences, why it aligns with me, is that if I travel in the irrational way I sometimes do, I get to meet wonderful people. I get to access opportunities I probably wouldn't have normally. Mm. So I'm, again, setting myself up to future-proof myself in terms of opportunities. So that is very much aligned to me. Yeah. But if I buy lots of clothing and uh, no luxury products i mean doesn't feel really aligned with my values and what i want out of life yeah now of course that would be different for someone else if someone's interest and desires in fashion then of course buying clothes Makes is in alignment mm -hmm. so it's really understanding is the thing you're rational with aligned to your values yeah love that and um, i'm particularly stubborn about i'm particularly stubborn about I would say I'm very stubborn about detail. Um, you, you, you know, I, I'm stubborn to the point that I sometimes could accept 60, 70% perfect. Yeah. But if I spot something, I've got a quick eye to notice it. And so I'm like, okay, we need to edit this. We need to change this art. Uh, this needs to be done in a different way. So I can be a little stubborn when it comes to detail yeah. uh, and not let it go as much. I'm getting better, but uh, I can be stubborn. I'm not sure if it's to do with the fact I'm a Virgo. Uh, oh, but, uh, my I, mum's I, I a Virgo, a, actually. I have so. a high attention to detail <laughs> and I can be stubborn if it's not kind of done in a particular way. Yeah, no, my mum's very similar. <laughs> She's the 7th of September. When are you? 8th. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, cool. I love it. <laughs> when I was young, I would spend hours daydreaming about... Being an artist. Oh. I would daydream a lot about being an artist. I loved art when I was a kid. Drawing, colouring, painting. In fact, I won two competitions uh, when, when I was, I think I was six, seven years old. Yeah. Local art competitions. Mm -hmm. But as with many families, my, my parents said, you can keep doing art, but don't choose it as a career because it's never going to pay you. Uh, but keep it as a hobby. But I think art is who I am. Uh, yeah. like I'm very creative. And so even though I didn't go down the art route, I think through entrepreneurship, I still had that ability to express my creativity. Absolutely. Through some of the stuff I've done with marketing, through the collaborations I've made. For example, I've got a collaboration this September with a chef where we're putting together a six-course dinner menu in which each dish is inspired by a message from my book. So we're like, how do we take a idea from Simon's book yeah. and communicate it through food? And Ooh, that's that is a lovely kind idea. of like my creativity in action yeah. by seeing the business world as, as a white piece of canvas yeah. and saying, what am I going to paint on it? Yeah. So even though I daydreamed about being an artist when I was younger, I think I'm still accessing that, but just in a different, different way than way. I imagined. And, and I think you, well, at that age, it would be hard to imagine yeah. that future because so you don't know that that's there. Exactly. So. <laughs> oh. I could keep talking, but thank you so much. Yeah, honestly, loved all the questions and uh, such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. I appreciate it.